today for you all to share your own thoughts you might have about how best we can use these opportunities to get all our AOT judges from across the country uh, together. And, uh, you know, I'm especially excited about the timing of this because, you know, as some of you know, some of you know all too well, uh, SAMHSA just announced the new round of AOT grants. Uh, a few of the judges on today, such as I see Judge Brett in, uh, in Fort Myers, Florida, and Judge Prasher in Austin, uh, maybe a couple of are part of programs that are going to be just now starting up under these SAMHSA grants. So uh, we have some judges who are just at the very beginning stages of getting this off the ground. And then we have others who are like a few others, such as Judge Kazin and Judge Anderson, who are real pioneers in this field and uh, have been doing this for ages and uh, others who are sort of in between. on the So this is just a great opportunity for um, those of you who are new to this to really learn from the uh, experience of, of those who've been doing it and having great success with these programs for a while. Um, so what I thought we would do in this uh, initial meeting is just kind of try and bring to the surface some of the differences in the way AOT is applied because you know, th this is the very opposite of a one-size-fits-all type of concept. There are great variations in practice from place to place. And um, I would like to ask a few poll questions of you. Amy will, you guys hear my dog going nuts. That's because the mailman's here, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I w we're going to ask a few poll questions just to sort of bring to the some of these differences in the way AOT is practiced from place to place. And I think those are going to be uh, opportunities for us to have discussions on the pros and cons of doing AOT uh, in particular ways. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it to, and I, oh, by the way, also, I think maybe even before I get into that, we should probably all just go around and, uh, and very briefly introduce ourselves, say, uh, you know, who you are and what jurisdiction you represent. Um, probably would be better, better if we kind of just left it at that because we have a lot of people on the line. But uh, I'll start and say I'm Brian Stetton. I'm the policy director for the Treatment Advocacy Center and kind of oversee our efforts to uh, foster AOT implementation around the country. I'll turn it to my uh, colleagues, Betsy and Amy. Amy, you want to go next? Hi, I'm Amy Lukes. I am a social worker and I have worked in AOT programs and um, I am uh, running the technical side of things today. So if you have any problems, um, just type something in the chat box. Okay, thank you. Betsy is on just on the phone. She's having some internet trouble, but we should have her voice. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Betsy Johnson. I'm a policy advisor for the Treatment Advocacy Center. Um, prior to joining TAC, I was at NAMI Ohio for 10 years. I'm a family member and kind of wear the advocate's hat on our team. Um, I, I actually am here in Ohio um, where we have, I'm proud to report, we have 25 uh, active AOT programs at various stages of implementation. Okay, thanks, Betsy. Uh, so I can see, I'll, I think probably the easiest way to do this is if I just kind of call on people individually, based on the order that you're on my screen. So uh, I'll start with Judge Helmick. I'm Bernie Helmick from originally Laredo, Texas, but I preside in Hamilton County and we have a very active AOT program. We call it Ohio. Community Probate, yes. Cincinnati. Yeah, terrific. Judge Anderson? Yeah, Tom Anderson, Superior Court for Nevada County in California. We're a small county of about 100,000 people in North. Yeah, uh, Judge McGowan. I'm Quentin McGowan, the Associate Judge in Probate Court One in Tarrant County, Fort Worth, Texas. and. Uh, my counterpart, Judge, Judge Kelly, is also here, but the, the associate judges do the primary work with the mental health docs. Excellent. Uh, judge Prashner. Um, Dan Prashner, associate judge in Travis County. That's uh, Austin. Um, I do the mental health dockets, the commitment dockets, and i um, looking forward to getting this cranked up. Judge Liu, you're on mute, by the way. There you go. Yes. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cynthia Liu from Reno, Nevada. I'm a district court judge, and I handle the involuntary admissions as well as the AOT program. We're actually just finishing our four-year SAMHSA grant in September, so nice to see everyone. Super. Judge Kazin. Uh, judge Kazin, San Antonio. Don't let Brian kid you. It's really Amy and Betsy that are in charge. So true. <laughs> uh, Magistrate Specia. Uh, 
Magistrate Specia, are you there? Uh, you're, I can't see you. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, we'll move past you for now. Um, Judge Sweat. Uh, Andy Sweat, I'm a county court judge in Lee County, Florida, Fort Myers. Uh, we're just starting our AOT program. I'm very excited. I do I do most of the treatment courts here in town, and and this is a new one. We hope to to that will be very successful. Okay, thanks, uh, Judge Parsons. Yeah, Amy Parsons, the associate judge with uh, Probate Court Three in Harris County. Um, we are about eight or nine months to AOT, what we call 2.0, because we tried it a few years ago and um, got successes and some failures and we're trying it again and we just received uh, the same grant also here in Harris County so we're excited about that and um, I do a little bit of everything um, including the mental health dockets but I'm the one that does most of the AO, uh, hearings or status conferences um, Judge Cox um, will pinch it when I'm not, not able to so. Super thank you. Uh, Judge Rusu. Uh, hi, Robert Russo, uh, Mahoning County, Ohio, uh, probate judge. Um, just started an AOT docket about two years ago, and uh, glad to be part of the group. Super. Magistrate Hyder. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> hi, I'm Pat Hyder. I'm uh, from Butler County, Ohio, which is uh, south of Cincinnati. And... Um, uh, or north of Cincinnati, south of Dayton. <laughs> Bad with my geography. It's been a pretty hectic day. And um, uh, we've had an active AOT program for many, many years. I don't think they can. Fantastic. Yep. Uh, Judge, uh, Ma sorry, Master Yeager. Hi, my name is Vita Yeager. I am the hearing master for our 8th Judicial oh, District. I just want to give me on that. I the mental health so on the criminal side, I do our mental health court and our co-occurring disorders court. And then on the civil side, I do our involuntary admissions and AOT. Awesome. Okay, Judge Kelly. Hi, I'm Associate Judge Lynn Kelly, and I uh, am with probate court number two in Tarrant County, Texas, which is Fort Worth. Terrific. Uh, Judge Paulin. Uh, good afternoon, Jenny Paulin. I'm a general magistrate in Pinellas County, Florida. We are on our second year um, through our SAMHSA grant and it's going very well. We're expanding to other facilities and the program is working wonderfully. Fantastic. Uh, Judge Jasko. I think you're also muted, Judge. So your mute sign on. Uh, okay, you may not be quite able to take that off. Right. Can I come back to uh, BCF? Are you, uh, are you able to hear us now? Okay, uh, move on again. Judge Henderson. Yes, I'm a magistrate in the Cumberland County Probate Court. We're just beginning the uh, AOT program. But mostly, I just want to listen in. Try to learn what I can from y'all. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay, uh, Judge Conway. Hello there. Actually, I'm magistrate as well, and I am in charge or oversee AOT for Ottawa County, Ohio. And we definitely are a small county. We're approximately maybe 50,000 people, far more people in the summer. And we've had AOT now for really just since January 1st of this year. Um, so I'm like the prior gentleman, I'm here to learn as much as I can. Super. And I see we have two judges from New Mexico who are coming up on my screen under strange code, which I happen to know is how the New Mexico judges. Uh, I, got it, Tom. I think one of those is Judge Brickhouse from Albuquerque. Is that right? Yes, I'm here. Oh, no, thank you. Sorry to, yeah, sorry you to can't see me. Can you see me? No, nope, we can't see you. Okay, I got to figure out my camera thing. All right. <laughs> when we get started, I'll figure out the whole well, you camera. You told me yesterday you only just put Zoom on your 
computer, so. I do, yeah, I'm trying to navigate it. Our judiciary doesn't really uh, encourage the use of Zoom, so I'm not as familiar with Zoom as I am with Google Meets as a yeah. big platform. Gotcha. But in any event, I'm Judge Beatrice Brickhouse. Uh, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, we started our AOT program in October, so still fairly new, um, but, you know, very happy that we got the program um, started, and we're making progress even though we live in a COVID-19 world right now. Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> and we have Judge Schultz, I believe, as well from Las Cruces, New Mexico. There, Judge Schultz. Okay, some audio issues there. Can I go back to Judge Jaskell from LA? Okay, well, they're there as well. Uh, question here is, do you operate on a purely voluntary basis? And you can see the choices. Brian, you might wanna read those, they're awfully small. Oh, sure. Um, so the first choice is yes. A is we accept people into the program only who choose to participate. So answering the question, yes. Uh, the second is, no, we're willing to bring someone in who meets criteria on a contested petition against their wishes, but that's a pretty rare or never occurrence. C is, no, not only are we willing to hear contested petitions, but in fact, they're quite common, fairly common. And D is, no, we only hear contested petitions. We don't have anybody participating voluntarily. So we have a range of answers. Most people seem to fall into the B group. Um, which uh, is not surprising because most people do tend to enter AOT uh, on the way out of a hospital stay where they're viewing it as a, a ticket back to the community and they're usually in a pretty good frame of mind when they start. Um, but uh, I'm glad to see that most of our programs are uh, at least open to the idea of, of doing involuntary petitions as necessary. Let's move to the next question. We're going to come back to have discussions of all these points, but we just want to get a, a sense of the range of uh, your practices first. So the next question is about status checks. Do you hold status checks with your AOT participants during the period of the court order? Um, and first choice is A, yes, everybody's expected to return to meet with me periodically during the period of the order. I'm going to do check-ins with, with all participants. B, we ask certain participants to return if we think they need that level of supervision, but we're not doing that with everybody. Other people are uh, not, not expected to come in for status checks. And C, no participants don't return to court unless the order needs to be renewed or converted in some way, or there's some decision that has to be made by the judge. Otherwise, we're not going to see people again. So again, we have a range of practices. Most people, it looks like, are doing um, everybody coming in for a status check. And I can tell you that's not really a universal practice. It's not nearly 75% of the AOT programs out there that do things that way. I think it's this group is somewhat self-selecting and that these are the judges who are really into this. So maybe we have uh, kind of an over-representation of the A group here. Let's move to the next question. Okay, do you typically concern yourself as the judge with the specifics of each AOT participant's treatment plan? And by the way, for those of you who are, who just, whose programs have just gotten stamps of grants, who actually haven't started doing this yet, uh, you can answer these questions, I should have said this from the beginning, apologies, but answer these questions in terms of what you anticipate doing, expect to do, hope to do at this point. Obviously, you can't talk about what you're already doing. So, um, first choice here, A is, um, yes, at the initial hearing, the treatment plan has to be explained in court. I have to, We have to go through the provisions of it, the components of it, and find they're all appropriate, and then incorporate that into the order. Choice B is, yes, we concern ourselves with the treatment plan to some extent. I give the respondent an opportunity to object to anything in the treatment plan that they don't like or feel is unfair or unwarranted, but we don't necessarily go through everything. Choice C is, no, the treatment plan is incorporated into the court order, but it's not discussed at the AOT hearing. It's not part of what you as the judge are concerning yourself with typically. And choice D is, the treatment plan is just not submitted to me at all, not the way AOT works in our jurisdiction. And here we have our amazing even division of responses. So that should be an interesting uh, discussion. This, of course, is much is largely dictated by the requirements of state law. Let's move to the next question. 
which statement best describes the consequences in your court of an AOT participant's failure to adhere to court-ordered treatment? Choice A is I can hold the person in contempt of court for violating the court order. Choice B is it can lead to a pickup order issued by me so that the participant's treatment needs can be reevaluated by the team and we can see if the person needs to ha have uh, their order modified in some way, whether we want to make it a, even an inpatient order if necessary. Choice C is the treatment team has the independent authority to hold the person for an emergency eval. No order from the court is needed. Um, that's true in certain states where the you, you, it, AOT law simply says that the treatment team doesn't need to bother the court. They can just go ahead and uh, have the doctor issue the pickup order. Choice D is I can order them to return to court and that's about it. If they don't appear uh, in court, there's not much more we can do about it. And then choice E, our law doesn't give me or the treatment team any real recourse to respond to non-adherence. And I think that's actually almost never really true, but I, I understand that that's a perception that many have, so I'll look forward to, to that discussion. So we seem to have uh, a majority that um, have the process come to the, back to the judge for a pickup order. And I'm happy to see we don't have anybody who holds anyone in contempt of court. That's a relief. Also not surprising. Uh, let's move to our, I think our last question. Okay. <clears throat> Which statement best describes how you view your role as the judge in motivating and inspiring AOT participants to engage in their treatment plans? Choice A is over the course of each participant's time in AOT, I try to establish a personal connection with them and encourage them to maintain treatment engagement. Choice B is I try to impart some motivation at each AOT hearing. You might have sort of a stock thing you say to everyone who comes through the court, but generally do not try to establish personal connections with the folks coming through the program. And C, I view motivation as entirely the role of the treatment team with some assistance from the court order itself not really with me as the judge playing a role in that. I issue the order if it's appropriate. Other than that, I stay in my lane. Don't get involved in getting to know people or trying to inspire people. Okay, so we have, again, I think this is a self-selecting group reflecting the preponderance of people we have in the A category here. Uh, there certainly are plenty, plenty of programs out there that uh, you, you would find um, the judge just not really seeing that as part of their role at all. So that, that was really interesting. Thanks everybody for taking part in, uh, in that survey. I think it was, hope it was interesting for everyone as it was for me just to see the, the fact that there is this variety out there and just the very basic ways that AOT programs mm -hmm. operate. So um, I kind of like to take a little while to chat about each of these uh, questions and, the, and, 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 and how programs come down and answering them. Um, so let's start with this kind of first issue of does your AOT program operate on a purely voluntary basis without contested petitions? Um, can we put that back on the screen just to remind me of how people answered that, Amy? Is that easy enough to do? <laughs> no big deal. That's okay. I didn't mean to throw your curveball there. Don't worry about it. Uh, I will try. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, it, it's something I hear a lot in my travels, and I think we had a number of people say today that their programs are purely voluntary. Uh, there is a point of view out there that um, – you know, if someone does not want to be in an AOT program, it's not going to be successful. So there's really no point in bringing people in um, who have not agreed with, uh, you know, at least some degree of uh, enthusiasm to uh, to be a part of that. So I would love to have a discussion about that because I imagine there's a kind of a difference of opinion among the group. So would someone who holds that view maybe want to articulate a little bit more why they think it's important or why it's always been their practice to make uh, AOT purely voluntary? Well, I'll chime in at this point, um, okay. if that's okay. So we do like to try to have as much buy-in from the participants as possible, um, sure. mainly because, uh, you know, sanctions are a bit limited and most of it is motivational. Um, and I think um, because of that, I mean, we do have a lot of step downs. So we do have, you know, a lot of people who are at the hospital and AOT is enticing because it does help them get out of the hospital. So I say we're voluntary, but obviously 
if I have a person in the hospital that wants to be in the program because they're going to get out of the hospital, it's a bit on that line of B. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I said A, you. even though we kind of do B <laughs> at times. Yeah. Um, because we hold out that carrot to them uh, to encourage them uh, to right. go to the program. So I... Right. So I was kind of in between, to be honest. But even in that situation you're describing, it's not like it's not going to be a contested position. Like the person is not challenging that they meet the criteria. You're not having an adversarial hearing where you have to. Correct. Right. Correct. Brian, if part, part of the discussion, too, is the use of the term voluntary. Because yeah. I think, at least in my experience, if a person is dead set against being in AOT, yeah. and they're not going to participate, and they don't want to do it at all, yeah. um, it's it's a no go from the very beginning because we really don't have the teeth that a criminal uh, a court AOT does. Uh, so to, to to a large extent, they have to be somewhat voluntary. They have to at least uh, be motivated into it or encouraged into it or cajoled is another word into it. Yeah. Uh, so you can't really ever have a successful civil AOT without some level of voluntary uh, or build up to a level of voluntariness on their part. Yeah, but I think, so build up is, I think, the key words in that sentence, maybe, right? I mean, you're not yeah. suggesting that if the person is contesting a petition, hmm. that you don't go forward with it, right? No. Yeah. I'm and not, you, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying, though, if somebody contests it and says, I'm not doing a damn thing, yeah. it's kind of hard to get them to do anything. Right, right. I, I agree with that, but we, our experience is a little different. The way we're set up is if someone who's referred for an AOT petition gets um, an, an intervention, if you will, by a mental health professional and are offered services. If they accept services and they get assisted, you know, assertive community treatment wraparound services, but a petition isn't filed. Only if they refuse uh, ACT do we file a petition to compel them into the program. Right. Uh, most of our people are, you know, suffer from anisogosnia, don't um, want to admit that they have issues. Uh, and when they come in for the contested hearing, we spend about 20 minutes trying to work through what they would object to do that's already in the treatment plan and try to negotiate with them. Mm. And oftentimes, most all of the time, ultimately we're able to convince them to sign up for the program with the spice stipulating to the order instead of going through with the contested hearing. Part of that is because we have the strong support of our public defender's office. Right. But many of them still don't want to do this or that or do very little. And sometimes halfway through the program, they don't want to do anything. And then relying on peer support and just sort of the black robe effect, yeah. um, we keep them in the program. And for the, almost, for the most part, we've been pretty successful uh, with that with a few people going back to uh, force conservatorships because we just couldn't stop their decline. But for the that's very few of those. Yeah, that's interesting. So in other words, it sounds like you guys are not applying the filter at the point where you're asking the person, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And if they say no, that's the end of the story. You're bringing no, that's the start. Oh, yeah. Right, right. You bring them into court with the hope that you can change their mind once you can get across the table from them. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Does anyone well, have any? Yeah. Some, say, say they put someone on AOT, they don't have a choice. So we meet with them every couple of weeks, and eventually they understand that they have to participate and do what they need to do. And it seems to have worked out pretty well for us. Our program was structured in a way that we didn't have an opportunity to get um, low-level offenders in it because our grant was written that excluded anybody on probation or parole. So we ended up getting the most ill. Um, but I, I think for the most part, our agency did a great job and the court did a good job getting buy-in from people. Yeah. That's, so, that's you know, great. I don't know what the rest of the people do, but <clears throat> the I go into the community with the social workers 
and meet with the people in their own environment. So we establish a certain level of rapport and I can understand better what they're going through. I can sit in, in, the, in an office and talk to somebody and tell them they're gonna do whatever without understanding how they live and where they live and who they're living with. So the more that we're in the community with the respondents, the better success we're going to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Magistrate Speaker. And by, by the way, we skipped you in the introduction. I should just well, my, you know, my, my computer was acting up, so I was trying to figure <laughs> okay. out what was going on. Right. So uh, Magistrate Speech is from Cuyahoga County, Ohio. That's Cleveland. And they're one of the SAMHSA grantees that's also uh, about to go independent because that grant is about to expire. So, um, uh, so you, you mentioned, Magistrate, that you actually go um, into, you, you meet with people at first where they are. I mean, you, you're not bringing people into court for that initial meeting? You, well, initially, if they're on, I do Judge Russo's docket and Judge Gallagher does her own. Right. So Judge Gallagher sees the people in her courtroom. Right. People on my docket, I will meet with that front line who was the agency that we're working with, or we still do for a couple months. And then... I just started probably middle of last year, I'll go out to their homes, the group home, personal residence, whatever, so I could meet with them. So we kind of get on a little bit more level ground. Mm. And it, it seemed it seemed to do, it seemed to work. Now- That's amazing. It, it's, because I, I think they understand that we can, we're concerned about where the, they live and what they're doing if we're there. Right, right. And that, that, you know, is relevant to the discussion we'll have in a few minutes, I guess, about, uh, you know, how, how and if judges have a role in motivating people. But that's really uh, impressive and amazing to hear that you're uh, going out in the field like that. So kudos to you. I wonder if anybody has any experience with someone who um, really was an adversarial case at first, who, who was dead set against being part of this program, who contested their hearing and maybe even was, you know, ticked off at the end of their hearing to find that they're going to be placed in this program they wanted no part of, but who came around over time, who kind of came to feel the love and, and whose attitude really changed about AOT. Is that an experience anybody has had? Yeah, I have. Um, so <laughs> here in Las Vegas, we actually work with our police um, to identify the super users of our system. So yeah. the constant supers and see, you know, if they show up on our um, civil commitment or involuntary admission docket if they would be appropriate. Um, we have had, I would say 75% of our patients are voluntary, 25% really don't want to. And we've had multiple situations where because they lacked insight at the beginning, they really just didn't want to do it. You know, I still would ask them if you have anything else you want me to consider before I make the decision. I still involuntarily admit them and voluntarily admit them. And three months later, they're thriving and they are grateful for the progress that they've made. So that's why we don't necessarily exclude anyone if they don't want to, because we've <clears throat> seen examples of where they turn around and really do well. Right, right. That's, uh, that's great to hear. And I mean, I think Judge Kaysen's point is also probably, there's probably a lot of truth to that, that people who are just really oppositional and they just, you know, take a, you know, F.U. attitude about the very idea of being in a program of probably yeah. be the best candidate. But yeah, and, and I, I agree with Judge Yeager. I mean, that's how we do it. I'm just making the point that there, there has to be some level. You have to be able to turn them. You have to be able to, you know, uh, have them buy into the program. Yeah, you got to, I guess the difference, and I should have clarified it more, is you have those that want to be on, those that don't want to be on, and those that refuse to be on. Right. And, and and a lot a lot of them don't want to be on. I agree. That's why it's a court order. But you turn, you make the corner, you make the turn. But to some extent, if you get somebody that absolutely refuses, it does make the, you know, if you can't make that turn, it makes it tough on those. But we we still try. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Judge Kazan, it's interesting because um, uh, we had a case recently where he, the minute we put him in the program, he left the personal care home and basically said "f you" to everybody. Yep. But that next week. He showed up to the clinic to get his shot because he said, Judge Parsons said I needed to come to the clinic. So he disappeared again. Like he didn't stay at the personal care home, but he at least came 
to the clinic. So we're not ready to give up on him because we're like, well, he listened a little bit. He listened to one little carrot. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll have progress in the future. So we'll see. And, and those, those are, those are victories, Amy. They, those really are when that happens. You know, and I often tell people and you, what we, I think we can all agree. It's been my experience that you kind of have three people, three categories, roughly of individuals that come through the program. You have that first category that you just hit a home run on. You change their lives. You, get them to understand. Uh, then you get those people who you, while they're on the program, you know, they, they, they you do pretty well with them, but they're probably going to relapse once they're off the, the court order. Then you get that third category and we do keep those people. Those are the people who refuse. And the utility is much like Amy said, they might come around or at least you've got them on the radar. You can bring them back in as soon as they deteriorate in Texas. Yeah. So. Yeah. We had one recently who um, she while she was somewhat violent, I mean, we committed her, but she was agreeable to try the program. She has come around, she's gotten so good in her level of functioning about nine months later that she's actually expressed she doesn't want to get out of the program because she said the court is the only reason that the providers have done what they're supposed to do. Yep. And so she said that, she, that we're the one, that court is the one that's making her progress happen because the provider has had a history of not being the most, follow, they don't follow up as often as maybe they, I mean, she, you know, so, so it was interesting. Her perspective was, no, I need the court. Right. And that's the other, that's the flip side of AOT that so often gets lost in the way this is explained to the general public, right? That it's this mutual commitment. It's just as much about committing the system to the person as it is the person to the system. And, you know, especially with someone who is there reluctantly, I think there's enormous potential in really emphasizing that, playing that up, saying, hey, you have a right to the best quality treatment. And these people have put together a treatment plan with you involved that um, you deserve everything that's coming to you in this plan. And if you're not getting the services that you uh, have been promised, you need to let me know about it. I'm going to be your champion and help you get, you know, to, to, to communicate that to the person, I think can be empowering and maybe change their attitude about the fact that they've been pulled into this process. Well, and when the very first time they see you actually do that, yeah. that rapport happens quickly when they right. see, Oh, well, they're not only like calling my feet to the fire, like, Oh, why didn't I take my medicine? I'm looking at the case manager going, why didn't you call them when you said you were going to call them? And then they realize, Oh, Judge Parsons on my back. So I can say it at the beginning and tell them that's going to happen. But, you know, they're kind of like, uh-huh, whatever. But to actually see that happen, it instantly creates that rapport. Yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, I've, I've done that too, where somebody would say, well, the employment specialist was supposed to meet with me and didn't. And I'll bring the employment specialist in and say, what's going on and I'll do it in, with the respondent in the room and so they feel like we're on their side which is important because everyone's it seems like you know the doctors are telling them what to do you know the, the act team's telling them what to do I'm telling them what to do they right. need someone that's going to be on their side and right. that's important and uh you know, as Amy reminds us a lot, that, that responsibility is really on the part of the treatment team too, to never give the person that impression that they're being told what to do. I mean, you know, the AOT is not inconsistent with the kind of the recovery model approach that uh, has really taken hold in the mental health field where you, the person is a member of their treatment team and they're supposed to be engaged in every decision. You know, as, you know, as Amy likes to say, the only decision that's off the table is are you gonna participate in treatment at all? Other than that, you know, you gotta work with us to uh, figure out what, what you need. So. Brian, may I, may, may yeah, may I That's ask why when we have uh, in our initial hearing, either after a contested hearing or if someone stipulates to the order, we make a major part of that is also having the provider sign off on the order and make a point of explaining that to the participant that they're committed and we'll hold them accountable just like we do you. That's why we have them come back every two weeks, not just because of you, but because of them to make sure the providers are providing. Yeah, that's a great idea. And Brian, maybe at a later time uh, for a later subject, that fine, for another meeting, that fine art of how to, you know, tell the provider they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing without alienating the provider and the doctors, especially in a fledgling program, 
We have yeah. to learn how to talk their language because if we come across too strong on them, it, it, it really does have an impact on a new program. So just something to talk about later, how to do that. Being a judge without being a judge kind of thing. You know? Right. Uh, that's great stuff. All right. Well, that, that was really interesting. I enjoyed that conversation. So let's move on to the next uh, question on the poll. And the topic there was um, status conferences, whether you have them and, 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 and whether you do them with everybody. So um, the distinction here, and again, if we could put the question up there, Amy, it would be helpful. Um, but the distinction here is something we, you know, we talk about it a lot in our AOT implementation white paper, right? It's that difference between the active court model at one end of the spectrum where you have a judge who's really becoming a, a, a part of the person's life where they're going to see them periodically. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the uh, judge's umpire model where the, the judge is fulfilling their statutory duties, making sure that uh, due process is been satisfied and burdens have been met, but is really staying out of the overseeing treatment part of it. And of course, many programs that I think that our poll question reflected come down somewhere in the middle. You don't really have to go to one extreme or the other in which uh, model you go with. Uh, many find a happy medium. And one thing, you know, we have to stress about this is that there really is no data supporting or casting doubt upon the view that the active court model, having a judge check in with the person with some frequency, improves outcomes for participants. We have, some of us have some reason to think that's true anecdotally. I personally suspect if we ever do get a study on that, which I hope we will, it will find that there is real value in it. But, you know, the reality is the best studies we have now on AOT were in New York and North Carolina were performed in judge as umpire type programs where the success that those programs had really cannot be attributed to the judge holding status checks with the person. So uh, I guess where, the way I'd like to open this discussion up is to ask whether there is, um, those of you who answered in this survey question that you don't do status checks, um, if there's something you want to say as to whether that has been considered and ruled out, um, if that's an actual decision you've made not to do them, um, and if so, why? I think we had a few people answer that they don't do any status checks at all. Am I remembering correctly? So I'll jump in um, yeah. because, because we don't you do always. Retain, not others, right? Right. We don't. It depends on the participant. We try to meet the participant where they're at. And so some participants have a lot of anxiety coming to court. So we're trying to minimize that anxiety for them. Um, other participants love coming to court, so we bring them in. Other participants have to come to court because they're not <laughs> compliant, yeah. so we bring them in. So we really just um, try to make it based on the participant. Mm -hmm. Meet the person where they are, so to speak. Right. Yeah. There's also a subtext to that, Brian. I mean, a lot of us, or at least some of us, uh, don't actually do it in court. So. We do our staffings, for example, at the clinic, but we do bring some people to court, and those are the ones who are usually terribly failing because we want the whole, you know, you're in court now. But for right. the most part, our status conferences are done uh, at the clinic, in, at least in San Antonio. And, and I still have a $25 bet with you that when you do do the study, it's going to show that active judges do much better than non-active judges. <laughs> I tend to suspect that's true, too, uh, but I have to throw that qualifier and every time I talk about this issue. So, but you raised an interesting point because, you know, in, in uh, I'm glad we have both of our judges from Tarrant County on because they have a divergence in their own approach between the two of them, right? Judge Kelly and Judge McGowan in terms of where they hold those status checks, right? Judge McGowan, you do yours in chambers uh, where you do kind of sit down with people in a real friendly put the chat across the table kind of way. And uh, Judge Kelly, you do yours in court. Um, you have an open hearing where you bring people in one at a time, come up to talk to you. So uh, I'd be really interested in how you all feel about the reason you've made the choice you've made and whether you think that uh, it, it makes a difference to do it one way or the other in terms of how comfortable people are in returning to see you. And Judge Kelly, do you want to start with that one? Well, when I first was appointed to be a judge, I was actually assigned my own courtroom. So that might make a difference because I think McGowan at first didn't have 
course that he does now, um, as he should have all along. Um, so, I mean, I had the courtroom available. Um, honestly, I feel more comfortable being in the courtroom. Uh, I have my own sheriff's deputy assigned to me for security. And I mean, most of the AOT participants are, you know, uh, they come right up to the bench. Now this is pre-COVID, but um, you know, no problems. But every once in a while, we do have one who comes in who perhaps uh, indulging in illicit substances or there, there's a problem and there's a security concern. So no, I'm not gonna have that back in my chamber. I prefer to be in the courtroom. Um, but I think what I've found is that my demeanor when the participants come up to the bench, it's different than a very formal hearing. Um, you know, I greet them once I get to know them. I know them by name. We talk to each other. They, you know, I've had participants uh, bring their, you know, if they say they're interested in art, they like to do art. They'll bring, uh, could you bring me some of your art? They'll bring a catalog of art for the next bit, that kind of thing. It's a, right. we kind of, if they're willing, we get to know each other. And it's, even though I'm sitting up on the bench, I think it's, uh, it's a, usually a fairly friendly type Oh, no doubt. Uh, having sat in your courtroom, I can attest to that. Um, I, you know, I, 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 like, I like bringing them back into, into chambers because it is just a little more relaxed. And I guess I was horrified the day we had some of the Harris County and Smith County folks come up and the MHMR, our bar AOT team leaders, pointed out that when they come to the courthouse to see me, they're coming to see Grandpa. and We don't want to disappoint Grandpa. <laughs> and that was, a, that was a, a, an eye-opening experience. And I, and I guess one thing we're probably all missing at this point in the COVID days is the loss of that. I mean, we're not having the, the personal meetings. Uh, when we have our status conferences, we've now got the, the outpatient teams going out to the patients, and we're usually trying to do it. They're holding a telephone, and we're in this setup. And I've noticed, what, I, I mean, I think I've, I've seen some, some backtracking. You know, that loss of the direct interpersonal connection seems to be, it's a little harder to get their attention when they're standing outside in their garage looking at a telephone as opposed to it. coming into the office. And mm. I, I miss that and I hope we can get back. And I'm, you know, hearing Judge um, Specia talk about it. You know, I've, I've told him, HMR, I told the outpatient folks that I'm willing to go out to the sites to visit if they think it's necessary. And I'm, I'm hoping they'll take me up on that because I, I think the personal interaction is uh, I, we're losing a lot right now in the COVID distancing. That's, we're that's having a big problem right now. I'd like to make a comment on that. I've been doing all of my status hearings. We'd have very active status hearings and I've been doing them for 17 years in Butler County. And um, I've been doing all my status hearings on Cisco WebEx from since April. And um, I've actually found that I find them more intimate and more, um, that there's more communication um, and I think it's because uh, it, we're connecting kind of eyeball to eyeball and they're seeing me without a robe on and uh, I make a point of making sure that I look right into my camera, the light at the top of your computer when I talk to them so I'm looking right into somebody's eyes. And I was just on a training with a number of judges in Ohio. Um, uh, there was three of us that did a training for a couple hundred judges on how to do these hearings. And there was another judge from domestic relations that made the same comment that she has found that um, people are more, are more communicative. People offer more information. They have more to say. If she asks if there's any comments, people actually start to talk about their marriages. And she said, nobody ever did that in the courtroom. And what I found, I've done about 200 hearings now on, on, because we're doing our entire docket on this, is that I've had to lay some ground rules. And one of the ground rules is each person on their own device. When you've got like a case manager with a mask and then trying to stay kind of six feet away from a respondent with a mask and they're trying to use one camera and everybody's yelling at the camera, that's not conducive to an intimate conversation. And it's not the way that this platform is meant to, to be used. So I've had to kind of, like this week when I did my hearings, 
I asked the case managers if they could get the respondents set up in front of the computer. And then if they wouldn't mind, would they exit the room? And if I need them, I'll call them back in. because I wanted the respondent to be able to take their mask off and look at me and talk to me and, and look, you know, and I, I found that when I did some change and I, I'm doing this for contested matters, all of my hearings, I want people on their own device with their masks off not yelling across the room. That's not what this platform was meant for. And I found that when I do that, um, I, I, I'm connecting in a kind of a more personal way with some of now the higher, some of the people that don't have a very good baseline. That's not, it's not necessarily true. But some of the higher people where they're just as starved for human interaction as everybody else is. So they're, they're thrilled to see me. They're happy to see me and they just want to talk. I've had people show me their projects, artwork, whatnot, you know, and, and um, I, so I think it's, I think it's possible. It just really depends on how you're using the platform. You know, I can see where you would have pro problems I did in the beginning and we weren't connecting as well, but as this pandemic continues, you know, I think we need to try to really try hard to make this as personal as possible because I, I think we're in this for a while. Could I ask and, a question? And I, I, yeah, of course. Well, let's hear okay. Judge Helmick next then. Uh, and it's Magistrate Helmick. Oh, I'm my, sorry. My, but that's all right. My question is, are any of the respondents' attorneys present for these status conferences? Yes, and I've had a little bit of trouble with that. And, and, and when I did this training, the, um, the work group that the Supreme Court put together had about 18 or 20 judges and magistrates on it. And, and all of us have encountered the one or two attorneys that are having trouble with the technology. Um, most of the attorneys are sitting in their own homes or their offices um, on their own device. So they're, they're talking to the respondent also in the same kind of intimate, intimate way. They're looking right at them when they want to talk. I have had one attorney that refuses to use I, at first, she didn't want to get on a camera. Then I discovered that getting on camera wasn't really her problem. She just doesn't want to use any of her own equipment. As long as she's, if she comes to the court and gets on the equipment with one of our clerks, she doesn't want to, She doesn't want. She's afraid her equipment is going to get contaminated, and um, she's going to get bugs. Or I, you know, I, you know, we're in a different realm. I'll tell you what we did to accommodate her is that we have made a tablet available at the court for pro se parties or attorneys that have been required to appear by video that don't have equipment or don't want to use their own equipment. They could go to the courtroom, sit in a private room, and we will make the equipment available to them. Um, but she's the only one I'm having that kind of trouble with. And so these attorneys oh, are paid. Hi. Oh, sorry. The attorneys are paid for every status conference? Yes, they are. They are. They're court appointed and, and they're, they're required to appear for every status conference. And, it, you know, the respondents get to know them just as much as they get to know me. So somebody mentioned that comment about, you know, I'm on their side and, and I, I've got their back. Well, they've got, they've got me who's got their back. They got the attorney who's got their back. They've got our probate monitor who's got their back. So if there's an entire group of people there that are all kind of cheerleaders pushing people in the same direction. We do not have attorneys at this point in our proceedings. They have already been discharged in their duties as attorney ad litem. So I think the difference there is that when Magistrate Hyder brings people in for um, a, another appearance, it's basically at the end of the term of the order, right? Magistrate Hyder, if I remember correctly, you do six month, month orders when you're bringing people in, you're making a decision of whether or not to extend that order. So there's a, a ruling you need to make, and I think that's why you need to have counsel there. I think that's exactly maybe these are evidentiary hearings. You right. know, they're, they're right. they're, it's it's a status rolled into an evidentiary hearing. They're kind right. it's like both of them happening at the same time. Yeah. So I'm I'm actually making a finding that the application for continued commitment should be granted based on clear and convincing evidence, and then continue right. the commitment out. Whereas a, a pure status hearing that's in the middle of the period of the court order where there is nothing to be decided by the judge, it's just an informal check-in. I think we're in pretty safe ground that we can do that without counsel present, right? Yeah, that's a good distinction. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point that you brought that distinction up. Yeah, I think Judge and Schultz... I'd in, like to make... Yeah, yes. please go ahead, Judge can Schultz. You, Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. I just want... 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know why the video isn't working, but um, I'm glad to be here. And I just wanted to weigh in and agree that um, the <clears throat> remote connections with uh, certain additional procedures have turned out to be actually immensely helpful. Uh, for one thing, COVID-19, I, I live and work in a very poor county, one of the poorest in the United States on the border with Mexico and Texas, and we're getting hit with a very high rate of COVID. And um, the patients actually are worried about that, very much so. So they would prefer to be in their own homes, and it's the perfect opportunity to talk to them about self-care, to talk to them about COVID-19, talk to them about what they can do to, to continue to care for themselves. And also, I personally have just upped the number of check-ins that I do. Um, so rather than waiting a couple, two, three months for a staffing, um, I work very closely with my team. And when anyone starts to get stressed out, because understand here, it's, it's also, because it's very poor, there's really high stress in this community. And so as people even begin to stress out and, and uh, unwind, we add them in for emergency, uh, like remote hearing. And so just in the past three weeks, uh, I've self, I have motivated by encouraging people to uh, go voluntarily to the hospital to check in. And I've explained, it is, it is really painfully stressful right now. Everybody is feeling it with less resources with all the issues on your plate with mental health, no job, all, of course, of course this is difficult. Let us help you. And so uh, they, they do, it takes a certain amount of finesse to get people to turn themselves over to the hospitals, but we've also developed really great relationships with our hospitals here in this county so that we can call and the defense attorney is so great. He will, want, he will generally go to the house with them. We have an officer on the team. He, he'll sometimes come with the person. Um, so, I mean, yes, there are times for pickup orders. Yes, yes, but we try to do as much as we can totally voluntarily. And COVID-19 has actually increased our relationship with our clients, opened the door for very personal conversations, um, and I think in the end really helped a number of people along. But that's, that's kind of focusing on the circumstance that's at hand and incorporating it into how we do AOT, if that makes any sense. I mean, oh, and there are certain sense. things you have to, and, and there are certain things like if a person, if a client had bed bugs, right, I would know because I would get bed bugs. And so uh, now I have to, and of course we work with their landlords to get it all taken care of, even get them a new mattress if we could, uh, you know, work everything out. Now I have to say, any infestations, any bed bugs, how are you doing? Do you have enough food in your apartment? And people seem to really, to, I, I just am verifying what the other judge has said. People really appreciate that personal touch in the middle of the pandemic. So hopefully that makes some sense. It makes a great deal of sense. We really appreciate you sharing that. You know, I actually have a theory as to why there may be a difference in Judge McGowan's feeling like COVID has hurt uh, the ability to connect with folks, whereas some feel clearly that it has helped. 
And I wonder if that's because of Judge McGowan's approach before COVID to bring people into his chambers and sit them down at his desk and actually have an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, maybe if you were doing it that way before, you're not really gaining that aspect of it by switching to you know one-on-one -on -one communications over the web. Does that make sense to people? And maybe that's just an argument in favor of meeting people one-to-one -one rather than in open court to really find out what's going on with them. That makes a lot of sense because it, and when they people came into our court, it was the black robe effect. And, yeah. you know, it was my conversations. I try to make them very intimate in the courtroom, but I didn't realize how unintimate they were until we started having them with, I, they see me just like you see me right now. I am in my home office where I've been since April. And, right. um, and you know, they, they are, I mean, and some of them haven't, they haven't seen me that way. They haven't seen me like from the neck down with real clothes on, you know, they only see me with the robe on right. and sitting on this high bench. And sometimes I pick up my dog because he's got cancer and he's crying and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, and their lives are the same way. I'm seeing them in the group home or, you know, wherever they are. I mean, somebody this week didn't have a shirt on. I did ask him to put his shirt on, but, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, another thing yeah. that I think is missing is that when I do those hearings in the courtroom, all of the participants get to sit there and hear everything else and, and that's the, that's the best I, I think they get there. some positive things like if they're new to AOT and they see someone who's been there 10 times come up to me and I say hey John how you doing today how's your little girl how's your I mean I can be personal even though I'm at the bench and the others are missing out on that the other thing that I don't hear most of y'all talking about is we have these dedicated social workers who are fabulous we also have a dedicated physician assistant who does all of the medical appointments one person who works for the program completely but the social workers in our urban area normally you know when they bring the participants to court they may be spending an hour in traffic before they get there so they they have prepared a report in great detail, which I read the day before, but then there's always additional information. The social worker comes to court as well. And yeah. so usually they've learned some things during that car ride. And of course, we're not getting to do that now. I'm glad y'all are having great online experiences. Some of mine have been good, but like yesterday, one of them that, you know, the person was still in bed. I mean, I, I don't know. Some of mine have not been stellar. Mm. Interesting. And yeah, no, I appreciate you ma making important points about the advantages of doing open court uh, check-ins, right? Uh, I'm sorry, Judge Stormer from uh, Akron, Ohio isn't here because I know she's a real big believer in that as well. And, you know, what she'll say is that you know, the, she's calling the cases in a very strategic order. The people who are newest to the program go last. So there are certain things she wants them to hear. She wants them to hear the praise she is lavishing upon the people who are doing really well. Because uh, so they'll want to get it, uh, some of that themselves in the future. It's inspiring. Uh, she also wants them to hear how she's responding to people who are, you know, who need a little bit more of a, a stern voice. Um, so it, it's not an easy question. There's advantages of each uh, of each approach. Uh, at the end of the day, I guess it comes comes down to you as a judge and your personal style and what you're comfortable with. You know, it's interesting about this pandemic, it's sort of forced us to experiment, right, in something that we wouldn't have otherwise done. Very and true. what's interesting is, um, or what I've noticed is, the ones that have been around a while pre-pandemic, we'd already established that rapport face-to-face. -face. And we do it in the courtroom, but we do it in our, our mental health courtroom, which is very laid back. It's just a bunch of tables. It's not a typical courtroom. And so we have already established some rapport. So some of those people I found really have been uh, flourished a little bit better in the status conferences since they've been remote because they don't have to spend three hours in the car going to and from. It doesn't disrupt their day like it did before. You got to go through security. You got to go to the courtroom. You have to pay in the buns. And they, it's, it's like, oh, cool, great. I've got to, I can talk to the judge sitting on my bed and it really makes my day go smoother. I've noticed that with the brand new ones, that's where the challenge comes in because we don't have 
that face-to-face -face meeting. We're trying to implement more Zoom meetings, more actual, you know, so we can see each other rather than a phone call. But I yeah. think that for us, the distinction where it's, some things are, yes, obviously lost when it's not in person, um, but there are some benefits to it. But I think with the new ones, it's harder, even just on my end, because I forget who these people are because I don't see their face. And I'm right. trying to remember, okay, who is this person? What is their, what's going on with them? Even though I have the status reports. So there's pros and cons to, to both of it. And it's just been a forced experiment that's been kind of fascinating where I could see that in post pandemic, if we ever get there, that that the uh, video conferencing patients could be a useful tool at at some point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm wondering if anyone's experiencing any challenges with technology, people not having access to internet connection or the devices they need to do video conferencing with you. Has that been an issue anywhere? Have there been solutions to that? No. Yeah, we. We've had certain people, you know, in in areas of town where the bandwidth is bad, where the signal's yeah. bad, and it's yeah. it certainly compromises the ability to have a real conversation. Sure. Yeah. All right. So I love, I, I love the thought of of making sure that everybody's got their own device because you know having the social worker out there with the single with the single telephone and this arm's length. Uh, we may be able to, to do that because I think... Yeah, you know, there, there's an AOT program in um, rural that has distributed iPads. They've got had a, a whole bunch of iPads donated to them, uh, you know, outdated models or last year's iPad uh, that they've distributed to clients and they um, have tinkered with the software so that you can only, you, you can't, they don't have any resale value, right? Because can't do anything on them except have a video chat with the treatment team or the judge. They're just set up with that one app and no other apps can be put on them. So that removes the you know incentive that someone might have to sell it to get some money for drugs. <laughs> but uh, it's been remarkable, you know, this is in a rural remote area where it's really just hard to get people to come to court. This is all pre-COVID. You know, they were just dealing with the challenge they have every day of the people live far distances from each other. How do we check in on them frequently and see them? and ask them to check in with the judge. And that's the solution they came up with. It's been remarkably successful. Hey, yeah, Brian, yeah. do you know if- I was if, interested in that, con sorry, Oscar? I was just gonna say, do you know of the, just it dawned on me, I've gotten all these emails lately from the CARES Act and funding yeah. for the courts. And do you know if there's an opportunity for any of us to ask by, it's a it's legitimate ground to ask by virtue of the CARE Act uh, for funding for that type of thing. We have our individual iPads. I mean, I, I too require everybody, whether it's a probate hearing, guardianship, every hearing, everything I do, everybody has to have their own uh, screen. And it works great that way. Um, mm. You just have to be air traffic control as you're experiencing yourself today. But right. uh, but I'm wondering if the CARES Act, uh, just as a thought for later discussion, yeah, uh, we couldn't apply for some funding there, all of us. Well, I will tell that you that would be great. Probate Court 3 in Harris County, we did receive a grant. And honestly, right now, I can't tell you if it was the CARES Act or anything or whatever it was before because I I wasn't involved with the, the writing of it. But we did receive a grant for money to purchase. Um, I think we got 11 of them. Um, oh, wow. And we just got the, we, we actually literally just got the devices in our hat little hands about last week. So um, we have them. Now the issue is getting somebody to get them to the to the individuals and we're yeah. trying to figure out logistics because we don't necessarily want them to just hold it all the time because we need them for other things. That the, the thought was we got them originally because we were having issues with patients in the emergency room wanting to attend their hearings. We don't need them. They can't leave the emergency room. So we were thinking that would help them. That was pre-pandemic. But now we're thinking we could potentially use them for AOT. So we're trying to figure out how to make that work. Maybe, um, maybe your ACT team or your FACT team can take it with them, coordinate the meeting. Yeah, um, so that's and, and what that we're, oh, but we did get a grant, so it can be done. So I encourage yeah. people to do that because we can always use more. All of us, I know, can use more technology. Um, and I can, I can have some great idea. so that y'all can know where we got it from. Yeah, please email me. Please, please. Anything you want to forward uh, to to uh, to us, uh, we'll happily get to the whole group. Thank you for that. Um, so it looks like we're coming into. Does someone else wanted to say something before? No. 
Okay. So it looks like we're coming into the home stretch of our time and we have a few more of these poll questions. Maybe we can save a few of them for next time. One thing I wanted to make sure we had time for was just an open-ended uh, exchange for some of the judges who are newer to this, probably those of you who are part of the exciting new SAMHSA grant programs that have to uh, be up and running by December 1st. Uh, according to SAMHSA, that's when they expect I've been, uh, to be hearing your first cases. Um, so I w just wondered if there were any questions that some of you who are newer to this want to ask of uh, the judges who've been doing this for a while. Uh, this is a Andy Sweat. Uh, truthfully, uh, we just recently uh, got the grant, and uh, I don't know enough about it to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> and you heard my whole presentation in, in, uh, for hours, so now I feel terrible. Well, well I, I, if you remember, I, I had to leave and go do a hearing. <laughs> That's right. I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, you're, you know, some good news we can give you is that you're not alone in this uh, – road you're on, you know, this is an amazing group of people who would be really happy to help you uh, as you encounter. Uh, you know, that, that, that's one, the, the best thing about this is I, I, I love to ask questions of people who know what they're doing so that I can yeah. know what I'm doing. So I look forward as I, as we start this to, to, to helping y'all helping me be better at it than I am. Judge, uh, be, rest assured that all of us, any of us you call, and by the way, I thought I heard you said you do the specialty courts, so it's not going to be a big leap for you, I promise. Uh, you're a natural for it if you do the specialty courts. Uh, but all of us are a, a, a very close group. If you need any help from any of us, email, phone calls. Brian's got all our numbers. And I'm, I am just, you know, I remember back, it doesn't seem like a long time ago, where there was like three, we wanted a meeting of judges. It was three of us now. Look at the size of this thing. So it's a great thing. Sure. It is, and I'm question. happy. Someone said, had one, sorry. sorry. I was just saying I'm happy to answer any questions anytime. So I ditto uh, Judge Kazan's comments. Yes, go ahead. I don't know who was trying to say something. It's me, <laughs> Judge Brickhouse from Albuquerque. Is this Judge Schultz? Yeah, that was Judge yes, Schultz. Yes, hi. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> How are the same you? Day, but not all that close to each other. I'm good. Thank you. I'll have to definitely touch base with yes. you said. Yes, please call me. <laughs> so my question is, and it's kind of a big question, but, um, you know, of course, just like everyone, it's, it's been about March since we've been on, you know, various stages of shutdown orders, of course, and stay-at-home orders. In the last couple of months, I have noticed several of the participants just deteriorating kind of for obvious reasons, just feeling as though there's just nothing to do, you know, nowhere to go. They don't have those resources available to them to be able to go do art therapy or go to an animal sanctuary. And I mean, I just had hearings on Monday and a couple of people really literally broke down during the hearing of, I just feel like I can't keep going like this with nothing to do. And I just curious what you know if I could get some feedback on what more experienced judges are doing if you're facing um, those type of participants who are just you know very very sad they're very frustrated and at you know their wits end of what am I supposed to do I had one participant he actually said if I have to keep going on like this doing nothing I I'd rather be in jail. So do you have I a... do have a couple of ideas sorry. Okay great. Go ahead. No please please please. Me? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Judge um, okay, thank you. Um, actually, we're doing several things. That's a brilliant question. It's critical. It um, one thing we're doing uh, based on people's individual interests, like if it's poetry or if it's art, we make sure that they have what they need to do that. And then we ask them if they wouldn't mind sharing it with us at our next meeting and we have a follow-up meeting. We also, um, you know, we really encourage people to work with the AOT because they also have remote uh, conferences, video conferences, so that they're part of it. Uh, people nearing uh, the successful end of the program, I ask them to join. Uh, kind of as mentors in those remote, remote conferences. My brand new folks I bring into it. 
And there are other, uh, we make sure that, like their therapist, they get with, together with their caseworker to go around town. Maybe they need a new shirt. Maybe they need, we, we just use our resources, which are wildly thin, to do whatever we can to get them safely connected to their community. Um, it's not ideal. I mean, you know, I've been in isolation. If you could see the video, you'd see how long my short hair is now, four months later. But, uh, but we, we just are trying everything we can to get their interests um, recognized and met. I don't know if that helps any. Oh, yes, absolutely. You gave me some uh, good ideas. Thank you. Judge, have you, do you know if you have a curriculum-based uh, caseworkers, uh, if they are curriculum-based? So, for example, uh, the Center for Healthcare Services here locally, our ACT team, when they, they, they not only uh, are caseworkers, but, you know, they give them a curriculum on, on either their, their illness or their treatment plan or understanding or awareness. And uh, we've had a couple of people who expressed a lot of boredom, and, and we were very successful at motivating them to concentrate on the curriculum and the case I, the caseworkers changed the nature of their meeting to make it a curriculum base. Here's your task for this week. Here's your homework for this week. Here's what I need you to do to learn. And then, you know, they relay that back to the judge. And when you meet with them, they, they've got something to do. So how'd your homework do? What did you learn? What was your task this week? What's your that's, task next week? And it's just a, a, that's a you know, it's not going to occupy all their time, but it'll certainly give you, Give them something to buy into and look forward to. They got time on their hands. Case and could you share some great, of those? I was just going to say that's a great idea, and uh, I'll certainly talk to them. Part of the difficulty is we had built up all these classes, like a budgeting class, learning how to budget, because we're getting people more and more independent, of course, as part of the goal. Uh, we had art classes. We, you know, out of thin air, we worked with community partners and built these classes for people. And those classes have not yet figured out if they can do it online remotely. So I like the idea of uh, working. I love my ACT team. And I know they will be very, very uh, open to this. So they may already be doing it, but thank you for that. That's a good thought. Great thought. In Las Vegas, our occupational therapists and our case managers have been actually bringing the project, art projects, or that kind of thing to them. So they actually go to their supported living arrangement with the materials and sort of like, this is the art project that we'd like for you to do. And, um, and then we yeah. discuss for it, you know, how that went, what really seemed to enjoy it. Great idea. Anybody else want to speak to that at all? I'm curious, are the clubhouses, for those of you who have a clubhouse in, in your city, have, have those all shut down now or just? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They just shut down. That's heartbreaking. Because those are amazing places. Our clubhouse in yeah. Fort Myers is doing stuff through, through technology having meetings, mm -hmm. Zoom meetings and things of that. Right. Nature. Wow. All right. Is there anyone else who wants to raise a question for the group or an issue? Okay. Um, anyone who wants to speak to uh, what we can do with these future meetings um, to make them uh, most, pro most productive um, and use this as a forum to help everybody improve their courts, programs. Thoughts about that? I like the idea of some brainstorming around those, those things, whether it's technology or engaging people, sort of what we've begun today in even a, a more organized fashion because clearly we um, are navigating a difficult time in the United States with COVID. So I think it would be very helpful to stay in touch, brainstorm, uh, sure. that kind of thing. For sure. And as I said, we're going to do these meetings every four months. So the next one will be 
Although that actually, in this case, that would take us to Thanksgiving. The last Thursday in November is Thanksgiving. So we'll do that one the week after, first Thursday in December. Um, but I, I agree. I mean, it's just a tremendous opportunity for people to have uh, conversations that can inform your practice. So if any topics are, occur to anyone that they want to make sure we address at the next meeting, please just email that idea to me or Amy or Betsy and we'll get it on the agenda for next time. And uh, who knows, maybe by early December, there'll be some breakthrough announcement about a vaccine and we'll be uh, <laughs> in a whole different place with COVID. Ryan, uh, what, yeah. what would be helpful to us is if you thought about uh, giving us some homework assignments between now and then, mm. that would be give us a topic each to, yeah. um, you know, here, here's you five judges. Let's, I want you to talk about this to the group and you five judges talk about this to the group. Give us some homework to do so that... Uh, you know, we, we come already armed with a discussion for you and our That's thoughts. That's a great idea. Curriculum-based meetings. <laughs> On my own acting. <laughs> well, I don't want to turn them into webinars, but I want these to be conversations. But, you know, that's a great idea. I have to yeah, go to a hearing. I'm going to duck out okay. before the homework assignments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've also got to get to a hearing and with anywhere from 800 yeah. to 1,100 cases in state court. Yeah. I think it's a blessing just to be here for this. Uh, I'm uh, glad. I definitely want to participate in these. So thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. And I think we can, we're probably ready to wrap up. Uh, this has been just a delightful conversation for me. I hope it was useful and productive for everyone to take part in. I know I enjoyed it. I was just going to just say, Magistrate Hyder, thank you for letting us see your dog. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> He's um he's he's got he's got liver cancer so you know what what always, he's always kind of he's at my feet now so if he needs some attention he gets attention he's 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 my baby he's over thirteen so yeah he's a good good looking dog I'm sorry he's sick sorry he's sick yeah me too <laughs> thanks all right everyone well, thank everybody you so thank you I hope to be talking to all of you uh, soon and we'll all get together again in four months. Thank you. 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 Thank you.